grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome, everyone, to the service of worship at Central Saanich United Church, both those who are here alive in person and those who will be watching online. Let us give thanks for this land on which we worship, the traditional lands of the Coast Salish First Nations, Wasonic territory, and home today of the Sayot, Sakum, Sartlip, and Pequachin peoples. May we have respect for the land and live in peace and friendship with all who call this place home. <coughs> World Communion Sunday. <coughs> That's today. World Communion Sunday, originally called Worldwide Communion Sunday. It's a gift of the Presbyterian Church, believe it or not, to Christian church communities around the globe. The first celebration occurred at Shady Side Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1933. The church's minister, Dr. Kerr, first conceived the notion of World Communion Sunday. It was his attempt to bring churches together in a service of Christian unity. The concept spread very slowly at first, and it was during the Second World War that the spirit caught hold, with worldwide communion symbolizing the effort to hold the war-torn world together, at least in a spiritual sense. It emphasized that Christians are one in the Spirit and in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, World Communion Sunday is celebrated by Christians around the world. It is a day to remember that Jesus Christ is the head of the church and that every Christian church and any denomination that promotes Christian unity are one. On this day, people draw faith and inspiration from seeing that they are part of a community that numbers over 2 billion believers and worshipers. Today we also acknowledge that it is Truth and Reconciliation Day, at least yesterday was, otherwise known as Orange Shirt Day. And I have a short video here about Orange Shirt Day. Hello everyone, my name is Phyllis Webstad. I am Shawetan from the Stratham, Kennel Creek, Hatchdom, Dog Creek First Nation, which is about one and a half hours southwest from Williams Lake, BC. I grew up with my granny on the Dog Creek Reserve until I was 10, then moved with my auntie after she finished university. When I had just turned six, I was sent to the St. Joseph Indian Residential School near Williams Lake, a place we called the Mission. My granny bought me a shiny new orange shirt to go to school in. When I got there, I was stripped, my clothing taken away, including my new orange shirt, and I never saw it again. <coughs> I was no longer excited to be going to school. I wanted to go home to Granny. I had to stay there for 300 sleeps. No matter how much all of us little kids cried, it didn't matter. No one listened to us. Our feelings didn't matter. We didn't matter. I am the third generation that attended residential school. Both my grandmother and mother attended the mission for 10 years each. Today is a day to honor and remember residential school survivors and their families. Every child matters, even if you're an adult. We must also remember those children that never made it and are no longer with us. Today is a day for survivors to tell their stories and for us to listen with open hearts. I am humbled and honored that you are all taking part in Orange Shirt Day. When I was in school, I didn't know my own history, so I am overjoyed that you are taking part in learning the true history of Canada's First Peoples. Cooks Jen, thank you. Hello, everyone. That's the origin of uh, Orange Shirt Day and where it comes from. I'd like to um, share a part of a prayer by residential school survivor Vivian Ketchum. Let us pray. Vibrant God, your creation explodes with the colors of the rainbow. Your peoples reveal the beauty of diversity. We lament today for the childhoods lost through the residential school system. We mourn for the spirits crushed and the futures compromised. Let us celebrate the hope and joy of every child let us hear 
the stories of resistance that make us stronger. Help us, O oh God, build the bonds of solidarity to ensure never again. In the name of the one who is child among us. Amen. Note that next Sunday is Thanksgiving Sunday. So please remember to bring your container of loonies and toonies or paper cash to support the Peninsula Food Bank in Sydney, part of our Blessing to be a Blessing project. Uh, I commend your reading, the announcements in the bulletin, and especially for next week, the worship committee uh, should note that there is a meeting on Thursday, October 5th at 1.30. And if you are a trustee, please note there will be a trustees meeting <laughs> after the worship under the wonderful leadership of Stephen at the back. So grab a coffee, a snack, and head back to the sanctuary for the meeting. And I know Helen has an announcement. This is an announcement for uh, Marlene because she is going to be setting up our Thanksgiving table next uh, um, Saturday morning. And so I would like to uh, ask if you had any produce that you would like to uh, put on our table, it would look wonderful. You can lend it to us or you can give it to us, whichever you like, pumpkins or squash or grapes or just whatever fruit you have. I saw some uh, pear apples there too. So out in the, in the uh, uh, heritage room. So this is all produce that God has given us. So if you can, please lend us some for next week's table. Saturday morning. Thank you, Helen. And Lisa, I think you have one or two announcements to make. You know me. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Zell, I'm chair of council. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> My good buddy Bill. <laughs> um, the first announcement is to reiterate last week's announcement that Bob is retiring and leaving us as of the end of this year, and Amy is retiring and leaving us as of the end of this year as well. So it will be a big change as we go into next year, new year, new building, we'll have new leadership for our worship and music. So we're very happy for the both retiring. It was a great day, but sad for us because they've been with us, Amy's been with us over 11 years, Bob's been with us for three and a half years, guiding us in pretty rocky waters and we'll hopefully steady the course and carry, carry forward without them next year. The second thing, other than that is, yes, uh, Helen, uh, I brought the Asian pears, big bucket, help yourself, I've got lots, I'll be bringing more. And I also brought um, some bundles of lavender, which I've left outside because I know some people are sensitive to it. Uh, over on the, on the uh, cedar stump, there's a big bag with bundles of lavender in there, take, take it as well, you're quite welcome to it. So those were what I uh, wanted to announce, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Are there any other announcements, celebrations? Just a very uh, quick one, Bob. Um, some of you may know, some of you may not. There's a, a new Canadian dollar coin that uh, um, was uh, minted on the 23rd of August. It's in memoration of Elsie McGill. Elsie McGill was the first female Canadian also to uh, be awarded an aeronautical engineering degree and um, she has a special place in the BC Aviation Museum. I went to the bank to get some of these coins. Not a hope, <laughs> we only deal with bills. So anyway, I went to the uh, Canadian Mint. I have one in my pocket if anyone would like to see it. And on the back of it is a small picture of a Hawker Hurricane, but she was very prominent in helping develop the ones that were built here in Canada. And it's in camouflage cups. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any other announcements, celebrations, anniversaries, birthdays? Yes. Your birthday was yesterday, Joe. Yes. All right. Oh, Any wow. other birthdays? <coughs> then we're going to sing for you. Yeah, my birthday. Oh, well, we my birthday was Wednesday. <laughs> oh. So we had, we had, well, we can sing again for you. Yeah. Are you sure, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Okay.
as we light this candle where we are here today. Let us be aware that across the world in churches near and far, candles are lit in faithful solidarity, witnessing to our common bond as followers of Christ. Let us join to sing our opening hymn. If you are looking, oh good, on the PowerPoint it is 401. Oh, in the bulletin it says 401. It should be 401. It should be 402. Oh, it should be 402. <laughs> Just in the bulletin it's 401. Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. The Lord is in the holy temple that all the earth keep silence. A quote from the book of the prophet Habakkuk. While silence may make some of us feel a bit uncomfortable, silence can also be the breeding ground for intimacy with God. When we're silent, we know that God is simply relating to us based on who we are. Not on what we're saying, not on what we're praying, not on what we're accomplishing, not on what we're doing, just who we are. So let us take a moment of silence of God's presence awash in that divine love. Today's piece of special music is to celebrate World Communion Day. Um, this song is called All Who Hunger and it's sung to a tune that is known as Holy Mana.
Good morning. Um, I notice it says in the bulletin it's uh, free. My wife and myself, and my apologies for we not being here this morning, but she just had a chemo infusion last Thursday, and so three days she's on a downward slope, and hopefully tomorrow she'll be coming back on an upward slope. <clears throat> Let us pray. Send us your spirit of wisdom, O God, so that we may hear your word speaking through the scriptures with ears that understand and hearts that respond in love. Amen. In the scripture reading, we find the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai, where the people have learned that they are to be God's holy nation, set apart for God's purposes. Upon hearing this, the people declare, all that God has spoken, we will do. Now the Israelites, Israelites discover what this promise entails. The people are given God's commandments as described in this excerpt from the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. Then God instructed the people as follows. I am the Lord your God who rescued from slavery in Egypt. Do not worship any other gods besides me. Do not make idols of any kind, whether in the shape of birds, or animals, or fish. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days a week are set apart for your daily duties and regular work. But the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie to others or about others. Do not covet your neighbor's house, do not covet your neighbor's spouse, servant, ox or donkey, or anything else belonging to your neighbor. When the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the horn, and when they saw the lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, You tell us what God says, and we will listen. But don't let God speak directly to us. If God does, we will die. Don't be afraid, Moses said, for God has come in this way to show you God's awesome power. From now on, let your heart fear of God keep you from sinning. And from the world around us, as a poem by the 18th century painter, engraver, poet, and visionary, William Blake. Blake was devoutly religious, but he had some major disagreements with the organized religion of his day. The poem, entitled The Garden of Love, expresses this arguing that religion should be about love, freedom, and joy, not rules and restrictions. From the Songs of Experience, 1794. I went to the Garden of Love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the Garden of Love that so many sweet flowers bore, and I saw it filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be, and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. Here in the readings from scripture and the world around us, and for these words and insights, we give God thanks and praise. Thank you, Tony. And we'll keep three in prayer. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I recall a wedding at which I officiated many years ago. The bride had been married before, but it hadn't worked out. And the divorce was messy and bitter. She had two small children from that previous marriage. A couple of years went by and she met this nice fellow. And he was indeed a nice guy, well-meaning, and clearly he loved her as she loved him. 
And they dated for several months and then decided to get married. By all accounts, their relationship was a close and healthy one. But one day, a few weeks after the marriage, she confided in me that all was not perfect. She had concerns about all these rules her husband was trying to enforce on her children. She noted that this was getting to be a real problem. The children starting to rebel against their new stepfather. She told me it all came to a head one day. The stepfather had made yet another rule, which the children disobeyed. And the stepfather went into a rage, yelling, In this house you'll do what I say. And then the older child got into his face and yelled back, Why should we do what you say? You're not our father. Their mother said to me, They're right, you know. You can't expect the child to obey if you do not have a relationship with that child. Respect has to be earned. Some people treat the Ten Commandments as if they are an abstract set of timeless laws to be applied universally, quite apart from a relationship with the lawgiver. To hear some people tell it, whatever is wrong with our society could be corrected by posting the Ten Commandments in every classroom, in every courtroom, in every home. The commandments are treated as if they are a means of calling us back to basic morality, as if they are just a set of moral absolutes without need to consider context and circumstance, a valid code of conduct upon which all people of goodwill can agree. Yet as the mother and her children realize, there will be no obedience apart from a relationship with the one who sets the rules. So before the first commandment was ever given, God made this declaration and issued this reminder I am the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in Egypt. It's as if God was saying, remember me? I am the one who chose you. I am the one who established a covenant with your ancestors. When circumstances separated you from the land of promise, I freed you from slavery. I am the one who sent you Moses to lead you. I am the one who released you from bondage in Egypt. I am the one who parted the sea that you might pass through on dry land. I am the one who led you through the wilderness with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I am the one who fed you each day with manna and who brought forth water from a rock to quench your thirst. By my presence, by my covenant, by my actions, I have saved you. I have called you by name. I have earned your respect and trust. I have proven my loyalty to you. And with that foundational statement in place, I am the Lord your God who rescued you, God issued rules by which life in the covenant community was to be governed. Or we might say that as God's relationship deepened with the people and their relationship with one another deepened, rules were established that spoke to the behaviors that the relationships called forth for right living with one another. At no time are these rules separated from a relationship with the rule maker. In fact, within Judaism, God's opening statement that I am the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery was taken as the first commandment. The redemptive activity of God was viewed as being so important that what we now recognize as a preface to the commandments, Israel interpreted as a commandment itself. So isn't that interesting that before we are told what we are to do, we are told who God is and what God has done. And because of who God is and what God has done, these Ten Commandments suddenly become more to us than a list of moral absolutes to post on the wall. They become a reflection of the nature, character, and essence of the God who has created us, saved us, and entered into relationship with us. Long before these laws were reduced to tablets of stone, they were written on the heart of God. And for that reason, these laws are as indicative as they are imperative. That is to say, they are indicators of who God is and indicators of who we are to be in relationship to God. 
and they cannot be fully understood or applied responsibly and contextually apart from that relationship. Now there is a time in one sermon to delve deeply into each of the commandments, to consider their original meaning and context, to consider what they might mean in a different time and different context. Let me just consider a couple of examples to explain what I mean. The fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, was a prescription requiring the able-bodied to provide care and support for the elderly, and is to be understood within the context of the extended rather than the contemporary nuclear family. The commandment was not primarily about children obeying their parents. It was about society fulfilling its intergenerational responsibilities. The third commandment, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, or in other versions, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, is commonly understood today as not attaching the word God to certain expletives, or as a colloquial expression of shock or surprise. The concern in its original context was to avoid the invoking of God's name, to vouchsafe one's own questionable veracity, or the invoking of God's name to inflict curses upon one's enemies. So this causes me to think of conflicts in more recent history, where political or military leaders have used God's name to justify their brutal actions while they brag that they, and not the enemy, have God's favor. Or using the name of God as an excuse to colonize, oppress, or even enslave other peoples, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. It is important to recognize that these commandments have been interpreted by the church, historically, in its concern for social justice. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church, for instance, explains do not murder, or in other versions, you shall not kill, as relating directly to social behavior. I quote from the Catechism, that society helps in the attainment of living conditions that allow for its citizens to grow and reach maturity, having adequate food and clothing, housing, health care. The 16th century reform confessional statement in explaining the commandment do not steal asserted that this includes working for the good of the neighbor so the poor may be helped in their need. Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, echoed much the same when he interpreted this commandment as meaning we are able to, in his words, help and befriend our neighbor in every necessity of life. The point I'm making here is that these rules, these commandments, are not moral absolutes. They require interpretation, contextualization, and always, always must be considered in view of our understanding of who God is and what God does for us, our relationship with God. The basic meaning of the word Torah, referring to the first five foundational books in the Bible in which we find the Ten Commandments listed, is to point the finger. In these rules, laws, commandments, God points the finger. God points the way. This is the way, God tells us. Walk in it. This is the way you can have abundant life. This is the way to the joy and love and peace that passes all understanding. This is how it will go well with you. Sadly, throughout human history, such rules have been used, or rather misused, to oppress, to control, to exert authority, sometimes in cruel ways. Consequently, it is important to understand that overarching and undergirding all these laws is the greater law of love. And so there are stories in the Bible of these laws being bent or even broken by Jesus. He broke laws when love would demand it. He cured on the Sabbath. That's just one instance. Jesus warned against relating more to the law than to the lawgiver, relating more to the letter of the law than to its spirit. There was a time when I obeyed my parents because I was afraid not to. I was obedient usually, but I necessarily didn't want to be. However, later in life I obeyed them because I loved them. 
and he knew they loved me. I wanted to please them, in part because of all they had done for me. Jesus said it this way, if you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, the relationship comes first. A relationship of love precedes a life of obedience. That's what was missing with the stepfather and his stepchildren, a relationship of love. Obedience flows out of a loving relationship. A little boy was riding his tricycle furiously around the block over and over again. Eventually, a police officer noticed him and stopped to ask the little boy why he was going around and around. The boy said he was running away from home. And then the police officer asked why he kept going around the block. And the boy responded, because my mom said I'm not allowed to cross the street. <laughs> Obedience will keep us close to those we love. <clears throat> On this World Communion Sunday, might we pray for and work for a world in which rules and laws are based on relationships of mutual respect, care, and concern for one another. Rules and laws that are put in place and obeyed because we want a relationship with others that is founded on love. A love that for us as Christians is a love exemplified and taught by Jesus Christ. In the end, it's not about the law. It's about the lawgiver. It's not about the rules. It's about the relationship. God is not some step-parent who has just shown up with an oppressive set of rules. God is the one who, out of love for us, brings us out of places of bondage, and by God's grace will lead us to places of promise. Thanks be to God. Let us respond to the word now, singing together, God who has caused to be great. As this is a new uh, melody for us, I'll play it through one time.
much from you in Christ and in creation. Bless the gifts we offer so that they will speak of your love for the world in all its detail and diversity. <coughs> May our gifts touch the need around us in the name of Christ, who makes us one. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Continue to meet Sunday after Sunday, observing the Sabbath. In so doing, may we be encouraged and inspired to spend the rest of the week serving and being in the world in Christ-like ways. You tell us to honor our fathers and mothers. Encourage us to support in respectful and loving ways to those who have raised us and nurtured us and encourage and inspire a culture of respect and dignity for all those seniors and elderly among us. For those whose experience of their parents is fraught with complexity and hurt, bring them healing and comfort, and gift them with the company of those who are loving and nurturing. You say to us, do not murder, do not steal. Oh God, keep us from endangering or harming others. <coughs> Help us to be respectful and supportive of others. Move us away from destruction of our environment and the species that live in those environments. And move us to love all creation as you do. You have said, do not commit adultery. Help us to be faithful in marriage. We thank you for the special intimate partners in our lives and for those others we care for and love, such as our friends and family. Bless our relationships with your guidance and wisdom, and instill in us a strong desire to love in ways that reflect the nature and teachings of Christ. You have said, do not tell lies about others. Keep us, O God, from slandering, defaming, gossiping, and saying hurtful things about others. When we do err, may we be ready to apologize and to speak well of them, and to see the best not the worst in others. You tell us not to covet, not to want what belongs to others, or to cross relational boundaries. Rather, help us to be of service to our neighbors near and far, so they might keep what is theirs. Help us to live in ways that ensure everyone has enough of the resources of this earth to live comfortably and safely. Dear God, we pray now for all in this congregation who are known to us, we're suffering in any way in body, mind, or spirit. In a moment of silent prayer, we lift up people or situations needing your strong and caring presence. You are the Lord our God, who 
continues to liberate us with blessings too many to count, so that we might be blessings to others. In response now, hear us as we sing the prayer Jesus taught us.
God be with you all. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. Though creation sometimes weeps. We are not for you, God. For you created the heavens, earth, and all that is in them. You cast sunbeams, open flowers, and feed insects. You are beyond the galaxies, under the oceans, and inside each grain of wheat. You could sustain all of your creation. But you will not without us. Thank you for the wonders of creation and for your great trust in us. Though humanity sometimes weeps, we wait we for you, God. For you smiled on an outcasted Hagar, blessing her descendants. You guided the doubtful Israelites, leading them to freedom. You spoke through the judges and the prophets, providing words of wisdom. You lived among us as a teacher, healer, and friend, giving us a sacred path to follow. You could have made us self-sustaining. But you did not. Your love sustains us. Thank you for the worldwide fellowship of disciples who faithfully attempt to share your love with all of creation. Holy, 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 holy are you, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in your name. Hosanna in the highest. In Jesus, love incarnate. You provide us all we need for each day. His words comfort the weary. His actions challenge the contented. His touch heals the sick. His presence feeds the deepest hunger in our souls. In Jesus and in his feast, you provide for us the sustenance we need to respond to the cries of creation. The bread of life. Nourishes our deprived bodies. The cup of blessing. Revives our thirsty souls. The gathered community strengthens our growing faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. Though the church sometimes weeps, we, we wait lovingly for you, God. For centuries, Christians of different <laughs> customs, colors, and cultures have gathered to commune with you and each other through the sharing of this feast. In their partaking, you have been with them, just as you are with us now. And so we join with our siblings around the world by remembering that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and shared it with his disciples. said, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink. Jesus Christ, the true vine, He said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. For you and for all people it is shed. For the forgiveness of sin, do this for the remembrance of me. O oh God, we remember and give thanks for your Son, and we ask that you bless and pour your Spirit on these simple things, bread and wine. Make this broken bread all over our name. Make this full cup overflow in our with these elements, <laughs> nourish and sustain us, our way, our truth, our life, our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. Praise be to you now, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Shortly, I'm going to invite you to come forward to take the elements. And what you will do, of course, as you come forward, especially for those who are new to us, uh, come forward, I will take uh, a holder and drop piece of bread into your hands, you just have your hand there open, don't take the bread, and then you will take a little cup of juice, and then I'm asking you, as we've done a few times, 
recently, <coughs> return to your seat, holding the elements, and we will all partake of the elements together at my signal. And I'm going to invite Helen to come forward now to lead in sharing this bread and wine with you. The gifts of God for the people of God. Come. 